Hi everyone, welcome to module three. Uh, I'm so glad you could join us today. Um, this is a really important module. And before we get started, I just want to say, um, you know, it's so interesting that a lot of the textbooks out there really don't deal with this topic at all. I mean, um, personally, I've looked through like a bunch of them. I teach this course all the time. And um, there's a lot of really great textbooks textbooks out there on the marketplace. Uh, there are textbooks that students really enjoy and that I really enjoy using um, that are detailed, that are rigorous um, uh, on many, many issues. But you know, rarely um, do textbooks uh, deal with this particular topic. And I think it's just so central to understanding American government. Um, now, um, interestingly, there are some older textbooks that are unfortunately now out of print um, that, that do deal with this topic. So um, what I've done is I've assigned some reading for you guys um, from those older textbooks. And even though they are out of print, I've done my best um, in this lecture, in, these, in making these lecture notes that you're about to watch um, to, uh, to, to basically update uh, that material so that you have kind of like the latest picture and you can connect the dots between uh, where we have been in the past, which is what those older textbooks were looking at and where we are now. So I hope um, that this uh, very important material uh, will give you a grounding in uh, why we, 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 that is I and many other political scientists, uh, like to focus on this idea of a political clash at the heart of American government. And I hinted at this a little bit in the last module, um, but I'm really going to drill down on it a lot more today with you. And that is this clash at the heart of American government between those who advocate elite democracy and those who advocate popular democracy. Now, you may know that um, President Trump, for example, is sometimes referred to as a populist. And um, think for a minute about what that means, right? It means that he's someone, as you well know, he campaigned on the idea of draining the swamp. That puts him or places him, in his rhetoric at least, as an outsider, as, a, as someone who is a, a Washington, D.C. outsider later. In this semester, we'll talk more about the difference between insiders and outsiders in Washington, D.C., but it's just really important that you know right now that um, when one positions oneself as an outsider, one is generally sort of saying that, like, you're outside the establishment, and you're saying that the, the government is a kind of a rubber stamp for Wall Street elites, corporate elites. It's interesting that Trump presented himself that way because, of course, you know, in office, he hasn't really been anything like a populist um, in that economic sense. I mean, he has not drained the swamp. Many would argue, in fact, um, especially if you look at his uh, tax cuts that he's introduced and also um, the fact that, you know, the, the, the way he has handled coronavirus and the so-called CARES Act, the way it has privileged and uh, empowered uh, corporations, um, as opposed to ordinary people um, in the context of coronavirus, you know, has, has certainly sort of showed you uh, which uh, parties within American economy and American life that he is on the side of, right? It's, this, it's the big boys, right? The big corporate entities. And of course, that makes a lot of sense really in some ways because, you know, his whole life he was a real estate developer and a game show host and things like this. Um, so, uh, you know, he, he may have campaigned is what I'm trying to say on this idea of being a populist candidate. Um, but certainly since being in office, it would be hard to say that he has acted uh, as if he is a uh, popular Democrat, um, such as the sort of type that we were talking about uh, last week and, and which we will continue to talk about this week. So anyway, you're going to be uh, reading some great stuff for this week, but uh, just to sort of get the ball rolling here, when we talk about American political economy, um, you know, it, it, it's important to recognize that the, the sort of the Constitution, the basic rules of the game of American government, uh, we're, we're kind of put together 
um, in a very different world, right? Uh, we did not have the large corporations that we have today. And um, it's likely that the founding fathers would have had a very hard time imagining the kind of complexity, the scale of the U.S. economy um, such as it exists today. You know, it's a very complicated, very high tech, uh, high finance kind of economy that we have today. Uh, the founding fathers were working and writing in an age that was much more agrarian in nature, more agricultural in nature. So, um, you know, could they have anticipated the kind of things that we have today? Uh, could they have made rules for them in advance? Could the Constitution have been written perfectly to anticipate these things? Arguably not. That would be a bit. That would be kind of an unfair expectation uh, to put on the founding fathers, such as they are. Uh, so, um, you know, another point that the founding fathers uh, might have had a, a difficulty recognizing uh, or, or, or envisioning um, would be the fact that the United States would, um, you know, hundreds of years after they were around, um, uh, you know, in the context of World War II and the defeat of um, Great Britain as an imperial power around about that time, the other European powers kind of receding from the world at that point in time, and the United States sort of stepping up and replacing them after World War II as kind of the world's leading economic policeman. Um, uh, you know, what we sometimes call, and I'm not going to ask you to memorize this word or anything, but it's it, the, the word that often gets used in political science here is the word hegemon, H-E-G-E-M-O-N. Um, the United States today stands astride the globe as a world policeman, a world hegemon, um, and it oversees a globally integrated economic empire, an empire of capitalism, if you will. Um, and you may like capitalism or you may hate capitalism or be somewhere in the middle. Uh, that's neither here nor there. But uh, we must recognize, I think, that the world is overwhelmingly capitalist and that the United States is the principal enforcer and rule maker uh, of that capitalism. It is it is the world's policeman. But the, key, the thing is, you know, to think about, you know, is the United States acting as the world's economic policeman because the world needs an economic policeman? Uh, probably the world does need an economic policeman, so that's fair enough, right? But certainly the United States doesn't do it only for the good of its health, right? It's not only um, to... to um, uh, it's not only to 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 sort of do a charitable favor for the world. The U.S. has deeply vested interests in this, right? So, just think about the fact that uh, the world's richest one uh, percent, you know, the one percent most wealthy human beings on this planet, own half of the wealth on the planet. That's so important to think about. And um, the richest eight men in the world on their own, own something like the same wealth as 3 billion of the world's population, which is shocking. So that's just eight men on the planet, I'll repeat that, eight men on the planet own wealth equal to uh, the wealth of um, 3 billion people on the world's, on, on the planet. Um, so um, that's, that's, a, that's a striking uh, figure, but even more striking than that. I mean, already that's shocking, right? Eight, eight people having half the wealth of the world. That's crazy. Um, uh, but um, the, other, the other thing I think really to think about here is the fact that five, five of those eight men um, are American. Uh, Jeff Bezos, uh, Bill Gates, uh, Warren Buffett, um, a, a, a man by the name of Ellison, and uh, of course, our Facebook friend uh, Zuckerberg. Um, that certainly does show you then, you know, who is benefiting, who is drawing the most, who gains the most from uh, the existence of uh, America uh, in the world today as a global enforcer, as the world's economic policeman. Um, who's making the rules, who's influencing the rules. Because if you don't think money 
and buys you power politically. You know, I've I've a <laughs> I've a used car to sell you, and uh, it doesn't have an engine in it. <laughs> but uh, you know, th th this is the key thing to, and this is the theme really that we're going to be developing today. Uh, that um, immense power, immense political power, immense political influence flows from this accumulation of wealth. Uh, history shows us this. Uh, you know, you don't need to be some kind of raging socialist or communist to make this point or to see the, the, the historical evidence backing this up, right? I mean, we all may agree that free markets are great and wonderful things, but there's just no doubt. There's no doubt that um, if you are, if you are yourself someone who is a defender of free markets, um, and that's fine. Uh, you do need to think seriously on how you might respond to the argument that free markets in the long run seem to create massive accumulations of wealth. And th those accumulations of wealth have major significance in terms of power and influence um, over our economy. Um, you know, Bezos, Jeff Bezos, who we just mentioned a moment ago, he is on his way. Uh, to becoming the world's first ever trillionaire. Think about that for a minute. A trillion dollars, one human being owning a trillion dollars. Um, we like to think, and I'm going to come back to this point again and again through this lecture, we like to think that America is um, the land of the free, you know, the land of opportunity, um, where if you work hard, you can get ahead. Right. If you work hard, if you if you if you are, are, are disciplined, enterprising, entrepreneurial, uh, that you can make money and get ahead. And and so as as a result of that expectation, you know what what we sometimes call the Horatio Alger myth. You know, we have this belief that the rich people in our society must be people because of the way America works. They must be people who worked hard. Right. But I'm here to tell you today. Uh, and this will be a major focal point of my lecture, that that is not really true, right? No one becomes a billionaire, let alone a trillionaire, like uh, Jeff Bezos is on target to become. No one becomes a billionaire by earning it. Um, I will argue to you later in this lecture, and I'll explain to you why that's so, right? You either, uh, people only become billionaires through inheritance or, or theft, frankly, Right. So um, and that, that might seem like extreme language, but I'm actually going to back that up uh, later on in the lecture. Uh, and you will see that um, that 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 some of our wealthiest people are people who uh, did not, as we say, earn it. Right. That's the expectation. Wealthy people are good people. Wealthy people are people who have shown that they're morally good, morally correct through their hard work. That's the American dream. Uh, but the American fact, the American reality is anything but, right? Anything but. And um, the readings this week are going to focus on how uh, ordinary people uh, encounter the American economy versus what we sometimes call the 1%, the elites. And it's going to use the case study of Walmart uh, to try to um, impart to you uh, this valuable lesson, this valuable sort of perspective. And uh, so as we move through then the lecture today, you're going to get from me um, some complementary material uh, to go with that chapter. Uh, we're going to have, I'm going to give you a little bit of history of U.S. wealth inequality um, from about World War II to the present day. Now, obviously, we could go way back to the 18th century. Later on in the lecture, I will actually give you some older history going back to the 19th century. Certainly, that will give us some insight into, you know, where corporations come from and why uh, they have such power. Uh, but um, but uh, the, the point really is to try to set up for you then the reading in your textbook uh, that focuses so heavily on, on, on Walmart and the misery of the American worker who works for Walmart. And we'll talk about coronavirus as well. We'll talk about the Amazon strikes where um, our impoverished workers who are minimum wage workers working for these awful companies um, that treat workers like crap and, and, and that 
and that have really sort of shown themselves and demonstrated themselves to be absolutely careless about the welfare of their workers in the context of coronavirus. So we're going to update what's in your chapter for this week by talking about how some of this, these Walmart points also apply to companies like, um, like Amazon and, and how the coronavirus has really revealed in no uncertain terms um, the, the, um, the, the, the way uh, that, uh, that, that, that workers, um, you know, who, who have in the context of coronavirus really shown themselves to be, you know, we call them now, we've gone from calling them um, minimum wage workers or low wage workers uh, to now referring to them as essential workers. And it's been so interesting to see how the coronavirus has really shifted our imagination of, of who these workers are, you know, uh, because as we've all been consigned to our homes on lockdown um, and then reopening slowly, but, you know, n n not, you know, we, we mustn't forget uh, what lockdown was in the year 2020, right? Um, anyone who was around in 2020, who was an adult uh, in 2020, will remember the lockdown, will remember not being able to go out to school, not being able to go out to work. Um, even going shopping was difficult. But we had workers who are at the bottom of our um, reward structure, as we imagine it, right? Uh, they are the lowest paid workers, but they were the ones who, um, you know, had to go to... Um, to, to work and uh, those were the ones who um, so these um, low-wage workers are really uh, in, you know in times of crisis even though we pay them shitty wages right they're actually the real backbone of our society when times are tough right they're the ones that actually show up for work at great great risk um, uh, for themselves and, and um, you know, don't really get paid much for their trouble. So as we move on in the lecture then, we're going to talk um, about uh, some of the impact uh, of uh, these dynamics and these patterns, these trends uh, in the history of our political economy in the United States, uh, but also in the present day, right? Um, <clears throat> and we're going to talk about what it means for our civil society, what it means for our democracy, and and that's really where we're going to end up. Um, is is um, <clears throat> as I might put it myself, um, we're going to end up with the question of power, right? Uh, what does it mean to live in a democracy when uh, the economic system that we have empowers? such a tiny handful of people to have such a huge amount of power. Um, what does it mean for our democracy um, that, uh, you know, it, it effectively, even though we vote for our president and we vote for our politicians, those politicians, as soon as they enter office, are more or less under the direct influence of this tiny handful of people. Right and 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 cease in a sense to represent us and start to represent them. How does that happen? Right. We want to talk about that. That's that's where we're going to end up today. But we're not there yet. We got to start at the beginning. So so let's um, let's make some opening moves here and see uh, uh, how how we do and how we get to to the point that we really want to be making here towards the end. So um, let's talk about some history. Now, um, I want to sort of open up with just, uh, again, uh, some, some data, really, um, and uh, an argument that, you know, the, the problem isn't necessarily capitalism, okay? Um, now, a lot of what I'm going to be saying in this lecture uh, might make it sound like I am highly opposed to capitalism, and I just don't quite want people to get that impression. 
Um, the, the thing about capitalism, the thing about socialism is they're not black and white statuses, right? It's not like you switch from one to the other, like you flip a light switch. It's a spectrum, right? There's white and there's black, and then there's all these shades of gray in between. So, you know, please don't think of socialism as like something that only happened in Venezuela, right? A lot of people talk about Venezuela as like, oh my God, socialism, right? Like, look, if you want, if you, if you want to know how bad socialism is, just look at Venezuela. This is dumb, right? It's a dumb argument because it ignores so much um, about the variations. Um, remember, socialism is, is a type of capitalism as well. I mean, um, you only really get rid of capitalism when you have communism. Uh, most socialist countries historically have had markets, have had private property. So they have been a kind of a moderated version of capitalism, but they're still capitalist, right? They play by the capitalist rules of the game. And indeed, that's why a lot of socialist countries historically have stopped being socialism, have stopped being socialist, because they've had to, because they can't ultimately um, um, survive the way they want to survive. And they've had to make compromises with the pressures of the free market. Um, now, you can see just from the screen here, um, we can put our fingers on uh, two sort of expressions then of capitalist organization or capitalist politics, right? Um, there's the American, British, and Canadian model, and that's going to be represented in the top part of the diagram. And then there's the bottom one, which is represented more by countries like Japan, France, but I would add Sweden. Denmark, especially Finland, Norway, right? Now, let's be really bluntly honest here. Compared to the United States, Finland, Denmark, you know, the Scandinavian countries are absolutely socialist. If anyone ever tells you socialism doesn't work and gives you this crazy Venezuela argument, just say like, I'm not talking about Venezuela. I'm talking about Sweden, <laughs> I'm talking about Finland, right? These are countries where the government owns massive amounts of the industrial base in those countries. You know, the, 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 the private sector, um, you know, is, is a lot smaller in those countries. And um, in a sense, those countries represent uh, something that was possible in America and a, and, a, and, a, and a direction or an orientation of capitalism that was possible in America right after World War II, and indeed was pursued within America after World War II for a period of time uh, when America was uh, known as a Keynesian country. Now, I'm not suggesting that uh, the United States was ever as, um, shall we say, left-wing as, uh, as those Scandinavian countries I've just been talking about, or as, as Japan or as France. But I am, again, trying to sort of focus on this idea that, uh, that, that, that what we're talking about here is not unheard of in America, right? And America, of course, was never a socialist country or a, or, or a, or a, a, a communist country in that sense. But we must uh, understand uh, that, um, you know, with, within the Anglophone countries, within the United States, United Kingdom, Canada, where they started off... Um, having um, a, 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 a after after the World War II period, you can see it here on the screen. If you if you if you cannot see, um, maybe you're watching this um, on YouTube on your phone. Uh, try to watch it on a bigger computer screen and zoom in. Um, you know, make the video full screen, and hopefully you'll be able to see. Uh, the data here in the in the diagram on screen. Um, you, you, the key thing I want to draw your attention to is the year 1945, and um, and look at how um, after World War II, which of course ends in 1945, you have a kind of an alignment, um, similar alignment in Japan and France, and the United States and Great Britain, right uh, where. Um, the wealthiest people, um, the, the so-called 1%, or even here on the screen, the, the top 0.1%, um, don't earn um, a hugely 
uh, uh, you know, you know, uh, disproportionate amount of wealth compared to the ordinary person. Now, of course, they earn a lot more wealth than the ordinary person, but it's not like bonkers. Right? <laughs> this was the only way to say that. That sounds like an unscientific term, you know. Please measure this difference in wealth between the poor and the wealthy. Well, you can see after World War II, the gap was not bonkers. <laughs> but then later, after the 70s, the gap was bonkers. Well, forgive me, but I mean, that's exactly what the data on the screen suggests, does it not? If you look at what happens from the 70s onwards in the United States and in Great Britain, wham! That, um, that, that amount, that portion of the income share allocating to the wealthy really starts to soar and of course it's a it's kind of a, a zero-sum game really in that sense right because it means and, and i'll show you some data on this later on in the in the in the in the in the lecture um that that um that um that 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 increasing share of wealth uh, on the part of the 0.1 percent really does come uh, um, at a cost for the wealth of the bottom 90%. I, I will have data for you on that later in this lecture. What that means in, its, in plain English is that the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer, you know? And it's not necessarily the fault of the poor, that's for sure. Okay, so, but that is a political choice, my friends, right? Because what we've seen in Japan and France is... Um, is you know are, are countries that have refused to, to take that choice countries that have refused to be strong-armed to have their democracies strong-armed taken over taken hostage by the rich okay and so um you know uh, it's not like uh france and, and japan have necessarily suffered economically for this I, if you've ever been to japan it's an amazing place right they have the most high-tech trains in the world some of the best food in the world marvelous entertainment enormous buildings um you know it's not communist right it's a very free market society you can buy whatever you want you can say whatever you want right it's not a dictatorship uh, neither is france um but they have much longer lifespans um much greater happiness uh, way uh, lower incidence of uh, depression and anxiety than we do, uh, lower rates of bankruptcy, um, more stability in their uh, jobs, you know, in their contracts. Um, yeah, they're, I will go out in a limb and I will say that I think um, people in those societies are, are happier than they are in the United States. Um, and largely it's because they have chosen to stand up to the wealthy and not be bullied by them, okay? So um, so what we've seen in the West, even though after World War II, the Anglophone West, that is, what we've seen after World War II, even though we sort of started in the same place um, as Japan and France, um, is, is that we've kind of let the brakes go. We have um, taken the handcuffs off our billionaires and let them uh, away with, with, frankly, murder. I mean, um, as we'll talk about later in the lecture, 2008 financial crisis, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, we've given them a huge amount of influence over our government. And um, and what have what have you know? One question I'll ask later in the lecture is, you know, what what thanks have we, the ordinary citizens, uh, to, to show for it? You know, how have how have we been rewarded for letting them do whatever they want? Um, well, what they've given us are um, massive, globally scaled, uh, financialized markets uh, for commodities, uh, which have taken our jobs away and sent them off to Southeast Asia uh, and other places uh, where people are paid buttons and often work in really subpar safety conditions right um and we have to evaluate you know like well that's given us access to cheap things in in walmart we can buy a lot of chinese goods in our walmart things that maybe used to be made here um 
but you know, uh, now that they're no longer made here, we don't have those jobs in manufacturing anymore. That's eviscerated our middle class and made people in the middle class go more into debt in order to afford their uh, standards of living. Uh, but equally, um, it hasn't necessarily rewarded people in developing countries as it should. The people that have really benefited from this, of course, are the 1%. And you can see that in the data right on the screen here. So, um, uh, you know, promotion of labor competition is a case in point there as well. Again, the point is it is a choice. It's not a fate, right? We're not, none of this had to happen this way. Um, we could have done things differently. So a moment ago, I was saying, you know, that we really took the brakes off our uh, millionaires and our billionaires um, somewhere in the 1970s. So what happened there? And, and what language can we find to, to talk about this turning point? You know, if we were governing our economy and constraining our wealthy elites more in the name of democracy um, after World War II, what happened? Why, why, why were the 70s so important, right? Well, the answer to that question is the Vietnam War, in a nutshell. Um, it's a bit more complicated than that because, of course, we do have the emergence um, uh, around about that time too, of course, of Japan and Germany as competitors for the United States. Everyone knows this story, of course, but you know, after World War II, most countries in the world had their industrial infrastructure completely smashed by bombs, right? And one of the few countries in the world that really kind of came through that untarnished uh, was the United States. And it really allowed the United States to become a very powerful economic superpower indeed um, after World War II. So, um, you know, that's a real and serious point. Um, the United States then really could sort of serve a function then globally as a kind of an economic architect or an economic policeman, as I was mentioning earlier on. And um, that power was unquestioned by anyone, except maybe, of course, like the Soviet Union. But to be honest, like the Soviet sphere kind of stayed in its box, really, with, with limited exceptions. Um, we could talk about the geopolitics of the Vietnam War, to be sure, um, for some. It, that that was a, a sort of an indication of communist expansionism, but really, like historians now, when 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 they've looked into the facts of the Vietnam War, really dismiss that idea um, that, that the Vietnam War looked like a war against communism to many Americans. But for people living there, they weren't really that interested in the ideology. What they really were interested in was fighting a civil war against um, corrupt leaders. Um, and elites who uh, were denying them democracy. But the United States got involved anyway, and the point is, for our story today, it got involved at tremendous expense. Um, to, to fight the Vietnam War cost billions and billions of dollars, right? And um, at a time, of course, as I was saying, when... Um, Japan and Germany were kind of coming online with advanced consumer goods that were really kind of able to compete with American consumer goods. And it was at this time, really, that um, be because of the debt of the U.S. economy uh, and because of these competitive pressures, many American um, uh, businessmen uh, began to worry about the debt and they began to worry about the cost of labor, right? Because it, they, their, their compet labor, of course, is a cost of production and they wanted to bring down the cost of American labor. That's the bottom line. When American workers had no competition from anyone else, employers didn't really care about the cost of labor because they could still make a massive profit in the world. After um, the uh, emergence of competition, they really did begin to worry about this um, quite a bit. So, um, so we need to sort of trace the story then. We need to connect the dots um, from the, this new competition and the Vietnam War through uh, the decline and ultimately the ending of America's status as uh, the hegemon we mentioned before. Um, and, 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 and the key turning point here is 
uh, the uh, end of uh, the, um, the what, what we what we call the gold standard. Okay, so what does that mean, right? Let's think about this for a, for. A, and I could go into a lot more detail in another lecture, uh, but we do have to sort of kind of hit this point a little bit too quickly and move on. Um, but one of the tremendous innovations that U.S. policymakers introduced after World War II, which really kind of secured America's place as a hegemon. Remember, that word is spelt H-E-G-E-M-O-N, hegemon. And one of the tremendous innovations that U.S. policymakers um, introduced after World War II that really kind of secured America's place as the hegemon was the gold standard, right? Um, that meant that um, uh, the the United States um, would uh, 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 basically um, allow U.S. dollars to circulate around the world with the promise attached to them, right? Um, a, a, a verbal promise um, that, uh, that 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 paper money was convertible into a fixed amount of gold. And th you might think, well, isn't all money kind of convertible to gold? Sure, but the price of gold goes up and down. If you're going to say your money is convertible to a fixed price of gold, um, that, that can be quite a promise. But the United States was willing to do that as the number one economic power in the world at the time um, for semi-selfish reasons, right? Um, and but but ultimately at, at great cost to itself um, by linking the value of a paper dollar bill to to a certain amount of gold uh, what the United States was saying to the world was this currency this US dollar is as good as gold right and you can count on it you can trust it um, and use it if you want as a currency uh, keep it in your central banks if you wish. Um, keep lots of it in your central banks if you wish, um, uh, because it, 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 it's, its value will be predictable into the future. And what other currency on earth can you say that about? huh? So the United States is a very wealthy country, was willing to do this, willing to commit a certain amount of gold to every dollar bill that was circulating in order to provide this um, kind of comfort blanket is that the right word to use i kind of want to use that word here because what what you're kind of saying to central banks and to um um businesses and individuals around the world is if you have this dollar bill in your pocket um unlike other currencies that move value all the time this one really is different right um so so it became the dollar bill became a very trusted currency in global trading. People were willing to hold on to it as opposed to fixed assets um, and, and, and have faith um, that, that a currency could be used for trading not just yesterday and today, but tomorrow and next week and next month and into the future. So what I'm really trying to get across here, the point I'm trying to get across is, is that it, it gave tremendous confidence to the global economy and it had tremendously positive results. Again, we're talking about after World War II here. It had tremendously positive results because it, um, it, it allowed the global economy to, to prosper in the 50s and 60s and um, it, 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 it really, I suppose you could say, was one of the major political reasons as well. This, this prosperity was one of the major reasons why people didn't all kind of go the Soviet direction and embrace uh, communism. Now, I'm not saying that the world was like suddenly prosperous in any kind of like um, unimaginable way. Um, we must be real. Uh, um, the third world was still the third world. It's tremendous poverty now, then as now. Uh, but um, but but certainly one cannot gainsay that tremendous advances were made at this time. Uh, uh, Western nations uh, were willing to put together financial institutions because of this wealth, because of this stability and prosperity. Um, to to loan money to assist 
uh, many of these countries, these poor countries, to build valuable infrastructure projects like dams, bridges, roads, um, you know, to industrialize, to, to, to build farming infrastructures, health infrastructures, education infrastructures, which they just didn't have before. Right. So at least at least not in any sort of uh, tangible way. Uh, some had some access to um, health uh, and infrastructures for education from colonial times. But the colonial countries were not always the best at making these things equitably available. Um, so, guys, if you're with me so far, um, you, you have the post-war years in in mind and and we saw on the previous slide um that in that period of time the united states was kind of like being pretty aggressive um making sure that uh, its billionaires did not accumulate too much wealth largely that was going to be done through taxation right so the taxes were being used ultimately to make sure that the united states could could commit its dollar bill to gold and also to help develop the, the world economy and to help develop the American economy as well, right? In a just and equitable way. That all came to an end in the 1970s then, okay? So this is where we need to be um, in our conversation. Um, <clears throat> the United States, um, it, it became known around the world was printing money in order to pay for the Vietnam War and for some other costs costs that it had and um you know uh people aren't stupid and they realized that the united states was printing more dollars than it had gold in its treasury now if the united states has said every single dollar bill is backed by gold but there's only that much gold and there's this many dollars you kind of go like well i don't really think they're going to be able to do that so famously there's a kind of a cartoon moment where the french sail a battleship up the river hudson that's the river hudson of new york city um and uh, go to the central bank um in, in new york uh, the treasury that is and um and and basically say we would like to um convert our dollar bills to gold please <laughs> and uh of course the uh president nixon at the time is like yeah, we don't have, if everyone does this, we won't have any gold left. So we're not doing it anymore. So this was the end of the gold standard, um, such as it was. And um, it was it was disastrous, right? Because it meant that that thing, that magic pin in the whole system that had kept it all together after World War II up to the 1970s that had created all this prosperity that I've just been talking about um, was now no longer in existence. So this is a pivotal moment for our story, friends, uh, because now we are able to talk about a new word for us. The word is neoliberalism. It's such an important word. I really need you to know that. Now, neoliberalism is an ideology. That is to say, it's a way of imagining and a way of thinking about how we should govern our economy, but also how we should uh, use economic tools to change our political orientation as well, okay? So it's not just, I mean, some people say neoliberalism is, um, is about free markets. It's not just about that, though. It, it has a, it, 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 people who advocate neoliberalism quite explicitly do so because they think it has a, it's, that it's because it, not not just because it allows for entrepreneurialism and things like that, but because it it punishes people who are lazy basically and educates them in so doing that they need to take responsibility for themselves, right? And what I need to really sort of emphasize is that there is this moral aspect to it. So let's let's try to explain how that works. Now, at its most simple level, the ideology of neoliberalism is expressed here in the Slide, simply expressed, neoliberalism is a theory which argues that decisions about production and allocation of resources ought to be left to the market and not government. I think that's easy enough to understand, right? Small government, low taxes, 
and uh, allowing then, encouraging, maybe even we can say through not taxing them, entrepreneurs to be entrepreneurs, right? Um, so uh, this is a major uh, difference. It's a turning point from what we had after World War II, which is where we were keeping taxes high on our wealthy people in order to pay for social goods and services. Now we're sort of flipping it around. We're saying that because the United States has gone into debt from the Vietnam War and uh, because we need to compete with Japan and Germany, we can't afford to have our um, highly generous social welfare system anymore. Uh, we can't afford to uh, have our major corporations committed to generous pensions and healthcare plans for our workers anymore. Um, we now need cheaper labor uh, without those benefits. We need more flexible labor without those benefits. If we're going to be able to compete, in other words, make goods and services more cheaply and compete with the workers and corporations of these newly emerging other nations. Hopefully that makes sense, folks. So um, um, what are the assumptions of neoliberalism then that are going to um, persuade our politicians, if you will, um, that the neoliberal way is the best way, that the neoliberal way is better than what happened after World War II? Well, um, economists were brought in who who had these assumptions. I remember I said it is an, an, an ideology. Um, it's also a, a way of, like, it's also more than just an ideology, right? Because once it's implemented, it has real-world significance. But in the 1970s, it was just an ideology because it had never been put in practice, right? It, 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 didn't, it didn't have real-world uh, evidence at this point in time. So anyway, in the uh, 1970s, then the economists come along and they make a number of points. They say, first of all, that markets are always efficient and morally desirable, right? So efficiency is going to be huge here. Uh, markets, um, uh, are, are efficient because of the laws of supply and demand, right? It means that, you know, there's this classic um, cliche, you know, of the Soviet Union, uh, that it could produce all the things really that it needed, but it couldn't get them to where they were necessary to be, right? Um, so the, 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 the cliche is, you know, uh, one month, if I live in a certain part of Russia in the Soviet Union, uh, one month I'm going to the grocery store and they have like aisles and aisles of toilet paper, but they don't have any potatoes, right? Uh, meanwhile, in a grocery store in the other part of the country, they have aisles and aisles of potatoes and no toilet paper, right? So what's happened there, um, as opposed to under free markets, is that uh, because buyers have not been able to express their signals with their currency, their, their, their purchasing power um, to the supply chains about where goods and services are needed, the goods and services are kind of allocated through um, human, human decision-making, which is fallible, right? Um, markets, then, if, if, if we sort of take the human out of the equation and just listen to what the markets are saying, then you get a sense, studying the data, this many potatoes are needed here on this day, this much toilet paper is needed there on that day, and therefore not all, you know, the toilet paper in the country goes to one part of the country and not to the other. Um, you have a you have a sort of a more consistent um, and um, y useful uh, distribution of goods and services. So I think that's that's what I think is meant when people say that markets are always efficient and desirable. Uh, uh, and that, and why neoliberals argue for that. So it seems like a good point, right? I mean, there's something, there's definitely something to that. Um, now, um, free trade between nations, not a huge aspect of neoliberalism. I was saying a moment ago, kind of complaining a moment ago, frankly, uh, about all our jobs going to, you know, Asia, whatever. But, but it must be said in defense of neoliberalism that from their point of view, at least, um, 
we should celebrate this aspect because look every nation on earth has something that it's good at and you shouldn't really specialize and try to specialize in things you're you don't have natural talent at right it's kind of dumb you won't make money that way like um if you live in a hot country why would you specialize in things that cold countries do better vice versa like you're not going to offer tropical holidays in the north pole right doesn't make well, you might with global warming going this way the way it is you might someday actually do that but but anyway uh, right now you're not doing that because it's obviously way too cold so so this is why we should say under neoliberalism nations should pursue strategies of comparative advantage do what you do well right um if you're a if you're a poor African country, look around. You know, there's probably something that you've got, some natural resource. Uh, maybe you, you, uh, you know, you're really good at some kind of agricultural product, like say even something ordinary, like nuts. Like maybe you make great peanuts. Uh, in which case, you know, maybe you could grow a lot of those peanuts, take advantage of your uh, blessings, your geographical blessings, grow a lot of great peanuts, become the world's leading peanut manufacturer. Eventually, you know, you specialize in making other kinds of products with your peanut, peanut oil, peanut butter, you know, these sorts of things. It's all, it's all there for you to imagine doing. So, I mean, this, this is the, 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 the fantasy of neoliberalism, right? You know, where, where everything, of course, actually works. And you specialize and you specialize and, 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 and then you, because you're the person that can do it cheaply and more be, uh, um, um, uh, higher quality than everyone else, you corner the market, right? You know, your poor African country becomes the world's number one peanut butter manufacturer and you become wealthy from that, right? Like you do well, you do okay. Your people get education from it and, and, and the world is grateful because damn it, that peanut butter is good, right? So that's the vision. That's the fantasy. Does it actually work in practice? Right? That's the problem, right? In fact, as we learn, it, it doesn't work in practice at all, really. Um, because uh, it, oftentimes, it's the case that the wealthier countries and wealthier individuals are the people you sort of need to bring into the mix in order to gain access to what we can call refinement or up the scale productivity okay so that actually means that um, you kind of um, you, you, you find that um, people aren't going to uh, how do I want to put this um, they're, they're they're not going to uh, want to buy the more expensive, version of your product from you if you're um if you're a, a, a raw material country you know making peanuts um literally uh you know people are just going to buy the peanuts from you right uh they they would prefer to do the advanced version of the manufacturing as close to home as possible um so um there's a lot of other problems we could discuss here with the idea of comparative advantage one other issue um, is the idea of asymmetric shocks. This is something that Taiwan and many other Asian countries experienced in the 90s. Um, they had really kind of specialized their economies in what they were good at, uh, which was um, manufacturing computer chips and semiconductors, um, you know, the kind of things we have on our cell phones and our computers. And what happened was um, they got so good at it that actually there was a glut in the global supply and the price came crashing down. Um, and, um, and many people would sort of say this is kind of like the setup then for, for what subsequently becomes known as the 1997 Asian financial crisis. Um, the, 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 the semiconductor glut um, means that uh, a lot of the economic strategies that these countries had innovated um, and were kind of counting on to carry them forward based on the idea of comparative advantage, actually backfired on them. Um, and because they had nothing else in the bag except their one party trick that they'd specialized on uh, in, um, they weren't actually going to be able to, to really um, uh, survive any kind of downturn in, in the price of that one thing that they were good at, right? So you are very vulnerable to 
the vicissitudes of globalization and global economic desires, uh, global economic markets, if you follow this comparative advantage approach. Anyway, that's the story of neoliberalism, friends. Um, let's see, now that we've talked a little bit about how it sort of played out globally, how has it worked for the United States? Has comparative advantage been good for America? Well, we're going to see, right? In fact, uh, the argument we're going to be making today is that neoliberalism has not worked in America either, right? Just as it didn't work for those other countries we were talking about, it hasn't worked here either. Um, and one really great way to measure that is, is just the fact that while the United States is a tremendously wealthy country, the wealth is distributed um, in a really unfair manner, right? Um, and uh, to, to, to make that point, just look at some of the figures on the board here, okay? You have um, American average income in 2019 uh, calculated according to the US, US Bureau of Labor Statistics at about $48,672. Now you might think, okay, average American income at $48,672, that's not bad, right? Well, hang on a minute. Let's see what happens when we consider the distribution of, of the average, right? Um, or the distribution relative to the average. U.S. average income for the top 1% of Americans is $394,000. That's 23% of income for the whole country, just going to the top 1%. If you extend that out to the top 10% of income earners in the United States, um, the average comes down a little, right? Which makes sense because we're not talking about the top 1% anymore. We're now talking about the 1% plus the 9% under them. And you start to see that U.S. average income for the top 10% of earners is $250,000 a year. Um, and that that is 50% share roughly of the income basket, the total amount of income um, per year that's available under 2012 figures, right? Now you can start to see, um, if you turn your attention to the graph on the slide here, and again, if this is hard to see on your cell phone or something, try to look at it on a computer or an iPad or something so you can see it a little bit bigger. But what you're seeing in the graph um, is some data from two economists, Piketty and Sayers. Um, this is uh, showing uh, the widening gap and the movement, uh, the widening gap and movement in uh, the distribution of wealth between the top 10% that we've just mentioned and everybody else. Because if you take away that $250,000 we just mentioned, which remember is like, which we said that's that's roughly 50% share, okay? And then you figure, try to figure out the average income for the bottom 90%. Um, you see that that works out in 2012 figures. Now, earlier on, we mentioned 2019 figures. Here, here we're dealing with just with the figures offered by Piketty and Says, which go up to 2012, right? So, um, we are uh, seeing that in 2012 figures, 90% uh, of Americans were making just $30,438, right? So that's striking. Um, it's, it's striking because um, it, it, when you think about it, um, it's it's easy. It's relatively easy to imagine living on forty eight thousand. You know, it's, that's close to fifty thousand dollars a year. You know, um, it's not even fifty thousand dollars isn't great, but it's not. You know, it it you, you could imagine doing okay on it. Thirty thousand dollars a year, that's not great, right? That makes things really really difficult. And ninety percent of Americans are making an average of thirty thousand four hundred and thirty eight. Uh, dollars here. So that's, that is, um, uh, that's not, you know, that, that, that's, that's going to be tough. 
That's going to be real tough. Now, um, you might say, um, uh, well, you know, does that, does that mean what, you know, what if I work really hard? Um, I can get, I can make more than $30,000, right? If I'm coming from a middle-class family, I can, I can get up into that top 10%. Well, well, here's the thing. Can you? Because in fact, um, in the last 20 years, the growth in income, um, 68% of it, in fact, has gone to just the top 1%. And that's bad news for people in the bottom 90%, as you can see very, very clearly on the graph, right? There's no movement. If, if, if all of the growth in income is going to the top 1%, there's really no statistical data to support the possibility that you or I or anyone else are going to get up there, right? You and I and everyone else are just in our lifetimes, even if we work really, really hard, the data suggests we're not going to get into that top bracket. And there's going to be reasons for that. And we're going to talk about those reasons uh, in, in, in a while. But in a nutshell, they're to do with political power. They're to do with the fact that this, the game has been rigged, um, rigged for and by the rich. And, um, and there's other factors that come into play here too, like for sure. Racism is a factor here. I mean, it's impossible to deny it, right? Um, in fact, I can give you some other uh, data on median incomes um, for different racial groups, um, according to 2019 statistics from the U.S. Bureau of Labor. Um, we have uh, Hispanic median income um, at $37,000, Black median income at 41000 uh, white median income is fifty thousand, you know, getting higher and higher and higher. And Asian median income at sixty thousand. But remember, those are median incomes for um, the whole uh, category, right? In including the wealthy, right? So we can imagine that the white median is going to be distorted somewhat upwards <laughs> by the fact that, obviously. In that top 10%, it's it's going to be more white people. Now that's that's not the way we want it to be, but that is the way it is, right? Um, uh, th th there's not a lot of... Um, the majority of black people are poor, for example. The majority of Hispanic people are poor. Um, the majority of rich people are white. Now... Um, so so the, the white median income is a, is a little bit high, um, certainly, and that's why. But again, if you take away the top 10%, that number is going to be smaller. And so one has to, and this might sound controversial, and I, I certainly don't mean it to be um, controversial, but, but to me at least, what that suggests is that um, maybe one can say now that there's they don't measure this data as far as i'm aware i've looked for it and it's hard to uh, in my in my searching for it i've never been able to kind of establish what the median income is of white people without that top 10 percent stuck on that's what i'm trying to say and uh, and i don't believe that that is measured but i think you could conjecture because again, the top 10% are overwhelmingly white, um, that uh, it would, it, that, that the bottom 90% of white people are going to be, that their average income is going to be a lot closer to the average income of the, uh, the, the average black person. Do you know what I mean? So, so what that can suggest, and again, I appreciate this can be controversial, but what it could suggest is that it's, it's, potentially an accident of history rather more than racism um, and, and in fact there's a number there's a large literature that would support this um, that uh, explains um, you know that that the real issue here is class right the real issue here is poverty regardless of one's color um, you know again no denying that the the wealthiest people are white 
But once you take away the top 10% and you look at the condition of everyone else, it, it really is a, a class phenomena. It's the poor versus the rich. And it's just that the rich happen to be white. But, but you know, average white person, it seems to me, is about not that far, probably wealthier, but not that much wealthier than the average black person and the average Hispanic. Okay, so again, I appreciate that that can be controversial, and I don't mean to downplay um, the fact. Um, you know, uh, just to give you some some data on this, um, one third of uh, the U.S. population experiences poverty, and one third of um, African American children are poor. Um, you know, so so poverty is uh, is 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 experienced. And it's heartbreaking for those who who do experience it. Um, I think the real question um, to 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 raise here, coming out of this discussion, is the question of power. Um, and I like this quote here for this reason: um, the claim that the United States enjoys the world's highest living standard must be evaluated against the equally valid claim that the United States enjoys the greatest absolute inequality between the rich and poor among developed countries. Um, is this an accident? No, no. I, I said a moment ago that it might be an accident of history that the majority of wealthy people are rich, are white rather. Um, that's probably legacy phenomena from the fact that there were civil rights issues that were keeping black people down, Hispanic people down um, as the United States industrialized, right? Um, and in a sense then it's, the, the poverty trap has kept minorities, racial minorities kind of stuck in, in a class relationship um, to the rich. Uh, but um, there's no doubt that um, it's not an accident of history, if you follow my drift, that the rich are rich, okay? It might be an accident of history that they're white, and we can debate that. But um, what I'm trying to suggest is that it's not at all an accident of history that the rich are rich. Um, that is a question of power. And, 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 and we will need to discuss that. Now you, at home watching this, may be wondering, what's Professor Kiersey's problem with wealth, right? Why is he judging people for being wealthy? Well, let's answer that question now if we can. Um, um, your assigned reading for this week does discuss the fact that uh, Warren Buffett, who's worth $82 billion, um, pays less tax than his secretary. And um, we're going to have some numbers. I'll show you the history of, 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 of movement in the tax brackets in a, in a, in a moment, um, especially after, after President Trump uh, deregulated uh, t tax even more um, in his time in office. But... Um, we do have to sort of consider uh, why the United States, um, having gone from um, taxing people uh, so much in the past, is now taxing people, billionaires specifically, less. Actually, if I can, I'm just going to jump forward a couple of slides here and show you uh, some of the uh, movement there uh, on this. Um, the data on the screen here shows the tax rate for the wealthiest Americans. Um, this is the top marginal rate for tax. Um, and uh, you can see that um, roughly around about the time of uh, uh, the New Deal uh, by Lyndon, uh, not Lyndon Johnson, um, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, uh, you can see that uh, the New Deal under Franklin Delano Roosevelt taxes were very high and went even higher again than uh, under Eisenhower, uh, n hitting 91%, and start to come down then with Nixon, really start to come down with Reagan, and then Bush tax cuts brought the tax rates down to 35 
President Obama proposed rolling back those tax cuts in 2011. He failed. Uh, but even then, his his aspiration was really just to put them shy of 40 percent. OK, and that's nothing compared to what they've been in the past. In the past, tax rates for, on the, for top marginal earners, that is to say, not your entire. Look, we need to people forget this, right? When we talk about a marginal tax rate, we're not talking about taxing your whole income at 91 percent. We're talking about what you earn over a set amount of money. So what anything you earn under that money is not taxed at 91 percent. It's what you earn beyond that. Right. So we're talking about the real fat here. Right. You know, uh, you'll still be very, very rich if you're, um, you know, if you're if your marginal income beyond a certain point is is getting hosed for 91 percent. I mean, maybe not as rich as you'd want to be, but 35 percent. Come on. That's and so th this is low. Anyway, let's just take a quick look here at, um, at, at what President Trump did. Um, now, he President Trump has cut taxes even more than George W. Bush did. Under Trump's tax law, um, corporations paid um, billions, hundreds of billions less in taxes in 2018 and 2019 uh, than they did um, prior to Trump coming into office. And you can see here on the on the screen um, how um, the tax paid by the top 400 income earners in the country has declined from 1950 uh, to 2018. We are now at the lowest ever tax that we have ever imposed on our wealthiest people. It always amazes me that we still hear people say, oh, America's, you know, they tax the, they tax the entrepreneur you know, America taxes the entrepreneur something terrible. We're always, at, you know, come on, guys. Like, this is ridiculous. Uh, the taxes on wealthy people are borderline non-existent. They're down to 20% now, basically. And, uh, and you can see, con in conversely, taxes on the lowest income earners are actually at the highest that they've ever been. Right? So... We're, what we're doing here, folks, is we're moving towards a flat tax society uh, where the wealthy and the poor are going to pay the same percentage of tax as each other. Now, it might even be that the rich are paying slightly less, but basically it's all flattening out. And you can see that very, very clearly on the information on the screen. Why might that be a problem? Well, you know, some people really like that idea. Some people really say, like, flat taxes are, are brilliant. Uh, we should have flat taxes. Uh, why should wealthy people pay more than poor people? Blah, 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 blah. Well, you know, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's an old saying, you know, from each according to their ability to each according to their need. Um do wealthy people really need that much money? This is the question we were about to ask. And, and, and the, 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 I mean, the, the reality is they don't, right? Uh, I mean, uh, what do they do with it, right? Do they, they, they buy five yachts. If we increase the taxes a little bit and they can only have four yachts in the Mediterranean and, as opposed to five, and we're not just talking ordinary yachts here, we're talking super yachts, and private islands in the Caribbean, things like this. Like, they can't be at all of their private islands at the same time. They can't be on all five of their yachts all at the same time. They can't drive all 20 of their extremely fast sports cars uh, all at the same time. If they only have half as many, they're still loaded. They still have the fastest sports cars in the world, right? And the fact of the matter is... It's not at all clear that they've earned this stuff, right? You might turn around and say, but it's their property. You don't have the right to take it. Hmm. But if they made their money through theft or if they made their money on the backs of other people, then the other people can be forgiven for thinking if they're suffering from lack of money and the billionaire over here has a load of money, the people who have no money would be quite forgiven for thinking that, in fact, something unfair 
is going on, right? Um, and 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 so we need to be concrete here. Um, you know, Bill Gates um, retired in January 2000, and he said at that time that he was going to give all of his money away. <laughs> And he did. He gave a lot of it away. He gave away fifty billion dollars um, of his a uh, hundred billion, and uh, fifty billion dollars is actually more money than a lot of countries have. So he's still a very wealthy man. And the thing about it is, Bill Gates, uh, since two thousand, since the year two thousand, that fifty billion has returned now again today to 100 billion. And he hasn't worked a day in his life since the year 2000, right? So without earning any kind of paycheck. Now, did he give away a lot of money? Yes, he did, right? Did that money matter for the people who he gave that money to? A lot of them were in Africa, uh, victims of AIDS, victims of malaria. Absolutely cannot doubt that, that Bill Gates' money and charitable giving was nice. But the thing is, nobody had a say about how that money was spent. Nobody had a say about where the, the money should go. Um, Bill Gates got to decide himself. And the question we have to ask ourselves is, why should any one man be able to decide what we should do with such a large amount of money? Um, Bill Gates, it must be said, decided what to do with that money, having himself arguably earned it through questionable means, right? <laughs> to put it politely. And you can say the same about a lot of these guys, right? Steve Jobs and others, right? Especially the tech guys are pretty easy case for me to make here, actually, because a lot of the technology that they used was appropriated, stolen uh, from the military, right? Um, in other words, uh, you know, the iPhone, for example, um, that is based on military tech, um, and, and the military tech was innovated by public money, right? It's the taxpayer that paid for the technology that eventually became the iPhone, but the public doesn't get any share back of the profits of the iPhone, right? That's something that's always troubled me and puzzled me. Um, you know, so when people turn around and say, aha, but you have no right to tax the wealth of the billionaires, well, I'm Absolutely. You know, this example of the iPhone shows, and you can reproduce this example, almost about all of them, right? Um, Bill Gates, uh, I was talking about him in a moment ago, and then I interrupted myself. But the point there was that, you know, he, he may not have stolen military technology to make an iPhone, but he did have a monopoly on the distribution of a certain software, you know, Windows software. All computers all over the world were once upon a time using Windows, Windows software, Windows 95, right? And if Bill Gates decided to build into this software an, 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 an internet browser, and one, right today an internet browser doesn't seem like a big deal to us, but when the internet was beginning, this was radical, okay? Browsing the internet was huge, and there were two companies that made browsers. One was Netscape, and the other was Microsoft. And Microsoft installed their browser as the default browser to force out its competitor, Netscape, which was worth a lot of money once upon a, once upon a time, but Bill Gates abused his position. Microsoft abused its position to push that other competitor under the bus. Okay, and eventually Microsoft did get prosecuted by the European Union for monopolistic practices, but it was too late then. Netscape was no more. So is there really such a thing as a self-made billionaire? We have to ask ourselves. There is, if you're willing to uh, consider theft and monopolistic practices as fair game in that process of self-making ourselves as billionaires. If you or I were to try this shit, by the way, you know, to steal military uh, uh, intellectual property or to um, engage in monopolistic, pro well, of course, we would be able to, we don't have the power, but, you know, if you or I were to try equivalent things in our own lives, we'd be put in jail. That's the simple fact. So, you know, these billionaires, they're not really good. I'm sure 
in as individuals, they're probably wonderful people to sit down and have a cup of tea or a pint of beer with, right? Um, but um, they are parasites, right? I mean, leaving their individual niceties aside, in the world, they are parasites, right? They either make money by having money or by stealing it. And it's interesting, you know, that, you know, as Bernie said, Bernie Sanders, I think, put it in a in a recent uh, d debate, um, you know, that that even if uh, we today taxed Bill Gates on his 100 billion, you know, he'd still have a couple of billion. <laughs> you know, so this is the question, like, are we serious? You know, how a hundred billion, like most of us would be happy making a couple of million in our lives, having a billion, one billion, you get to have yachts and mansions and a private jet with just one billion. You can have all those things, the private jet islands, private islands, yachts. If you have a hundred billion, I mean, that's bonkers. I love this little slide on the screen right here. This is a, a British journalist by the name of Ash Sarkar, and she was interviewed, you know, like, what is a billion? Like, can we imagine what a billion is? And her answer is, well, if you got one British pound every 10 seconds, you'd have a million British pounds in four months. But if you got one British pound every 10 seconds, you'd have to wait 310 years before you made your first billion, right? That's the difference between being a millionaire and a billionaire. Yet we are here having a conversation about Bill Gates having a hundred billion dollars. I give, I rest my case, y'all, and that, you know, it's, uh, it's, 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 we have to be real. We have to be real, right? Now you might say they're sitting at home, like maybe you're still not persuaded and you think this billions is, is, is fine. Uh, but still, you know, we need a radically free market economy. American capitalism is the bee's knees. And yeah, sure. Sometimes you get these billionaires, but you know, we have to have America because it's the, it's an, it's a land of opportunity where if you're willing to work hard, you can pull yourself up by your own bootstraps and get yourself out of poverty. This is sometimes called the Horatio Alger myth. That's A-L-G-E-R, Horatio Alger. You can look it up on uh, on, um, on on the internet and uh, see what comes up for you there. It's a bunch of old stories from the 1920s and uh, early part of the last century. But point being, it's long, long, long being part of America's self-identity that it is, and we'll talk more about this in a few slides time. It's long been part of America's self-identity um, that uh, it, um, that, that it's a meritocracy, right? Um, and this was in fact something that, um, you know, Tocqueville, who we talked about before, Thomas de Tocqueville, um, you know, who came from France to study American sociology in the early days, you know, he really remarked on this, you know, he thought it was a wonderful thing about America. And frankly, it was, you know, that, you know, in the new country, uh, all these people who'd come from Europe and previously had been sort of subjugated to, you know, legal systems where if you met a royal person, you'd have to call them sir or lord or something like this, where, you know, in America, everyone's equal, right? There's no sirs or lords. It's just you and your hard work. And if you become somebody, you know, you can do so. You don't need a lord uh, or a, a special royal title to be to become someone. You can just do it through your own hard work. So that's, that, you know, is a lovely idea. Let's be real. Um, but you have to ask yourself, how much choice and be just let's be really real about this you know if, if we're going to make this argument that anyone can work hard and get ahead and pull themselves out of the muck if we're going to make that we need to be real about how much work and um and and, and how you know what kind of sacrifice 
it would take. Now on the screen right now, there's a, there's a, there's a very useful slide, right? And we've got three guys on the screen, the minimum wage earner, the median wage earner, right? And the CEO guy, right? And the question is, how long would you have to work if you were one of these three gentlemen to be able to earn a gallon of milk, right? Now, the minimum wage earner earns seven twenty-five an hour. The median wage earner earns sixteen point five seven an hour, and the CEO guy earns twenty thousand one hundred and sixty an hour. And the gallon of milk costs the same for all three of them: three dollars seventy cents on average, right? So how long at the minimum wage does the minimum wage earner have to go at it in order to be able to bring home his gallon of milk? And the answer is mind blowing. A gallon of milk costs him half an hour of his life. The median wage earner can do it in 13 minutes. The CEO guy earns a gallon of milk in 0.1 seconds. So look, this is what I just mean by like being real here. Um, Barbara Ehrenreich wrote this amazing book called Nickel and Dime. It's discussed in your homework for this week. Great book, great reading. I strongly recommend you pick up a copy before you graduate from college because it really is one of those books that you just have to kind of read it to believe it. But it's it's she's a journalist and she just she gives it a go like she she's like okay everyone says that you know anyone can make it in america so what she does is she kind of takes it on she sets herself up she goes into uh you know uh, appalachian ohio i believe it is and um tries to take a minimum wage job uh you know she leaves all her creature comforts at home i think the one thing she did the one lug, the one thing she allowed herself to have was a car and everything else. She was just going to try to make it on minimum wage. Right. And, um, basically what she discovers is that, you know, with, with the price of rent and health issues and everything, it's just not at all possible. Right. So we need to get off our high horses here right? Uh, you cannot live with dignity and you certainly will have a very hard time living at all on minimum wage in the kind of service sector jobs that we have out there. And of course, a lot of these jobs are at companies like Walmart, which is interesting enough because that's the kind of job that Barbara Ehrenreich was doing. And that's the focus of the chapter it's the walmart job that's the focus of the chapter that you're going to read for this week but we can't just focus on walmart because obviously times have moved on and we need to talk about amazon and amazon is a new presence on the scene right these vast warehouses where you're not even dealing with customers anymore and the minimum wage jobs uh, that Amazon offers are very interesting. This is, of course, something that Bernie Sanders was huge, hugely critical of in his uh, political campaigns, right? Uh, because uh, Jeff Bezos, who owns Amazon, is literally the wealthiest man on planet Earth, right? We were talking about Bill Gates a minute ago. Uh, Jeff Bezos is on his way to becoming the world's first ever trillionaire. And yeah baby i mean like you gotta you gotta really hold your breath when you start to imagine what a trillion dollars looks like uh i mean i i i don't even have the brain capacity to imagine that much money but um what i want to do now um i wrote some stuff for this lecture I've, this lecture has been running a little bit long i've taken a little bit long to make my point but a lot of the stuff you need to know about walmart is in your um is in your um, chapter. Uh, I want you to spend special attention in the chapter to how it is that Walmart is made so cheap. Um, there's some great stuff there. Um, there's also some great stuff on the American consensus. 
Uh, I might come back to that in a minute, but what I really want to do right now is talk about coronavirus and and Amazon just for a minute. Um, so I just wanted to take a moment to um, to say a little more about Bezos, actually, and then we'll um, we, we, we'll we'll move on to other things. Um, it's uh, it's very interesting to think about um, these tax cuts that we've mentioned. It's very interesting to think about uh, this billionaire question in the context of coronavirus, of course, and. Um, the lightning rod figure here that we have to think about is, of course, um, is Bezos, right? Jeff Bezos, the wealthiest man on planet Earth. He owns Amazon. We were talking about Amazon. Um, they uh, run huge, huge warehouses all over the country. People who work in them work for pennies. Um, people who work in them don't have great, um, you know, um, conditions. They work long hours. Uh, there's a lot of stress. There's a lot of pressure, flexible contracts, etc. Um, Jeff Bezos also owns the Washington Post, which is interesting. You know that a, a billionaire doesn't just like lobby the government and buy off our politicians, but actually runs the media as well. And, uh, you know, a, a major newspaper, at least, um, you know, do we, do we really want our wealthy people also telling us how to think and how to understand the news? It's a good question. He also runs Whole Foods, the supermarket. Now, he's not a trillionaire today, right, Bezos, but he is currently worth $143 billion. And that's a lot of money. We were just saying a moment ago, like how unimaginable that sort of sum of money is. Um, but the thing is, his wealth is growing at an average of 34% per year right now. And if you do the math, that means he could, in the course of his own lifetime, become the world's first ever trillionaire. If, if that growth level keeps up. Um, now, I wanted to draw attention to all of this because, you know, um, coronavirus has been a factor of our lives in, in recent months, and it has had a massive impact on the economy. And, and government knows that. Um, our billionaires know that. Uh, and they're not dummies either. And I, and I don't think that, they un that, that they're in any sort of uh, denial of the fact that... Um, if nobody has a job, then no one's going to buy anything, right? So you got to keep, even if people are losing their jobs, you kind of got to replace their lost income with something. Otherwise, you know, that's a ton of consumption that's just going to like disappear. Uh, and so when billionaires, when the politicians that work for them, let's be honest, are confronted by this kind of a situation, they are going to think about giving money away. Right, um, not because they're generous, not because they're socialists, but because they're practical. Okay, they understand that the economy will tank if if there isn't a stimulus. And so, look, I mean, uh, there's a lot to say about coronavirus, but you know, one of the things we really have to draw attention to first and foremost is that the government did respond with a massive stimulus bill, two trillion dollars, in fact. Now, there's. I could spend three lectures talking about this stimulus and I still wouldn't get my points across. So I'll just give you some of like the main issues. The first issue really is that 500 billion, a quarter of the 2 trillion stimulus was reserved and set aside in business loans, right? Now, obviously those business loans are highly necessary, but most of those business loans were targeted specifically at corporations, not the small businesses that you or I would deal with mostly on a daily basis. 50 billion alone, I think, was reserved for the airline industry. So um, this is, uh, you know, hugely important to understand. Um, the 500 billion uh, went to the Federal Reserve, 
Um, something we haven't talked about yet early in the class, uh, we'll come back and talk more about the Federal Reserve later, but it's the Central Bank of the United States of America. And it's not an entity that's normally involved in fiscal policy. It controls interest rates. That's what it likes to do. That's what it was designed to do. And it's happy doing that. It's basically the Bank of America, not, not the Bank of America, the, the literal bank, but the actual like Bank of the Country of America. And um, in that role, um, it likes to, you know, monitor inflation and it likes to uh, mess with interest rates to make sure that inflation doesn't get too high or too low. Um, but what Congress and Trump did was they gave $500 billion to the Fed um, to basically loan to American businesses um, to make sure that they would um, be able to um, uh, get through coronavirus. And um, in exchange for this money, they're not allowed to lay off their employees, or at least not that many of them. And that's a good thing in some ways because we want people not to lose their jobs, even though you and I aren't buying anything right now because we're on coronavirus lockdown or what have you. Um, we want them, the people out there and us, to be still economically active or the bottom would fall out of the economy and all these corporations would just cease to exist. So, um, yeah, it was a good idea to give the businesses money. But what was maybe not a good idea was to give them money without any restrictions. And this is the problem, is that there was no accountability on it. So that money could um, uh, be used to um, engage in, um, I think they restricted what, what are known as stock buybacks, but what they didn't restrict was the ability to use the money to leverage CEO bonuses, right? Those are the bonuses for the CEOs, the head of the companies, and all these other sorts of things, right? So there's, there, there, you know, um, We've been down this road before. I don't have time in this lecture to talk about the 2008 financial crisis, but you know we bailed out the big banks then, and just to sort of stick a finger in our eye, um, just as ordinary Americans were getting foreclosed on in their homes and getting turfed out of their houses for not being able to pay anymore. I mean, like tons of Americans were like this, right? Like not just the lazy ones. Okay. Right. Like ordinary people were losing their homes in 2008, 2009, as a result of the financial crisis and the government bailed out the big banks, right? To, because frankly, they needed bailing out. Uh, if they didn't get bailed out, it would have destroyed the U S economy. Let's be real. Um, but in a very cynical move, I think a lot of them gave like stupidly huge bonuses to their CEOs, you know, and their top level management, um, you know, as a sort of a handshake, a job well done. You know, these are the same guys that caused the 2008 financial crisis with their irresponsibility. Um, and there's a lot of documentaries on this. Um, you know, uh, there's some Hollywood movies on this. Uh, you don't need me to, you know, what's whatever that one with Christian Bale is. Um, but you, you don't need me to explain this to you. Well, the same thing could be argued to be saying are taking place uh, right now. And I just wanted to draw attention to that because, like, why is the government helping some of these big corporations? I guess maybe some of them need it. Certainly the airline industry needs it. Does Jeff Bezos need it? Um, I'm not sure, right? Um, he's doing gangbusters right now, right? He's probably never made more money in his life than he has during coronavirus because all of us are shopping online and that's where he makes his money. And I wanted to mention him specifically because um, also on the slide here is a gentleman by the name of Christian Smalls who was fired from Amazon for going on strike. And why did he go on strike? He went on strike um because of the way um he was uh treated for trying to make sure that the people he worked with were protected during the time of coronavirus 
uh, because Amazon had not put in place adequate protections for their workers or compensation. Um, I'll say it again, I think I've said it a couple of times in this uh, lecture already, that, um, you know, uh, the thing about coronavirus is it's really revealed how low wage workers really are essential employees, right? Um, uh, we, we, we have to respect that fact. It's just, on, it's just true, right? Uh, these are the people who for decades we've been paying buttons, right? Minimum wage. Um, and we know that life has been hard on minimum wage. We know it takes whatever, 20 minutes, half an hour to earn that pint of milk as we just looked at. Um, but I think that uh, in this time, we would be lost, destroyed, all of us, if it wasn't for the grocery store workers that were willing to risk their own lives in the time of coronavirus to turn up for work and to work extra hard to sanitize everything and to make sure that when you and I go to the grocery store, there isn't coronavirus over everything, right? Uh, to implement social distancing spaces within the grocery store, etc. All at tremendous personal risk. And believe me, a lot of them have gotten sick. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's just a kind of an interesting way to sort of wrap up our lecture here. Um, coronavirus has left the country with a huge spike in unemployment. Um, the government has, thankfully, uh, temporarily stepped up to give $600 a month to people who have been laid off. And as we all know, um, sorry, $600 a month, it says on the screen, but it's $600 a, a week. I apologize, that's a typo. Um, but, you know, it's not, it's not like you've just woken up in Disneyland making that kind of money, right? Like it's probably more than people would have been making on minimum wage, let's be real. But it's not a huge amount of money, especially when you consider the fact that it does not include healthcare, right? If you've been laid off from your job, your job provided you healthcare, this $600 a week is not going to be great in that respect. So, you know, some people say like um, the lucky ones are the unemployed ones. Oh, they're making their, you know, but if it's some student, you know, or young person who, already, who still is with their parents, that is a lot of money, right? But remember, the reason why that money got circulated in the first place is not out of any particular generosity towards poor people or poor students or young people or anyone who got unemployed. The reason the money gave out is because if it wasn't given out, the economy would have collapsed. <laughs> you know, so it's not like it's just charitable giving or socialism, as they say, right? So anyway, guys, look, this was fun. Um, I am uh, really excited uh, to discuss this topic with you guys this week, and um, I hope it was useful for you. Um, it's a little bit different than the other stuff we'll be doing, um, but uh, I think it's hugely important to talk about, you know, the rules of the economy and who wrote them, right? Who had the power to write them? Um, it's not an accident that things are the way they are, right? It's not an accident that we have billionaires who are on course to become trillionaires. Um, it's, uh, it's, 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 um, it's, it's, it's not an accident. It's part of our political economy, right? Um, and, and, and wealth does come with power, right? Um, and that power matters for, for politics. In uh, the coming modules, you're going to hear me talk about a study uh, called the Princeton Study. It's carried out by a two political scientists by the name of Gillens and Page. And what they're going to show in no uncertain terms, <coughs> excuse me, a uh, sneeze. I don't know where that came from. Um, but what Gillens and Page are going to show in no uncertain terms 
is that um, wealth really, really influences policy, right? Um, simply put, if wealthy people don't like it, legislation will not pass Congress, right? Conversely, for legislation to pass Congress, at least four out of five wealthy people have to basically support it, okay? I mean, that is, that is mind-blowing, right? Um, so we leave it there, folks, for now, right? Um, this was very interesting. Thanks very much for tuning in. Uh, I feel like this was a long one, but but I think worthwhile. And I look forward to um, seeing what you have to say. Thanks so much, guys. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye.